Please, number sure. Okay, hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, final drawing club of the year. Uh, I'm John Dunleavy. So I'm, I'm sure we've got some students here. I'm sure we've got some um, potential applicants um, from further afield. Let us know where you're from in the chat. Um, maybe where you're located, maybe you're originally from. That'd be nice uh, to, to let us know. So yes, I'm John Dunleavy, course leader for the animation and the animation and visual effects course at Norwich University of the Arts. I have with me my co-host, um, Dan Kelby. For those of you come along for this, uh, you regular, my regular uh, co-host, Dan. But as you're, I'm sure you're aware, um, uh, Tom Moore from Cartoon Saloon is joining us as our guest, our special guest today. And he'll be sharing a, a little intro, but then delving straight into drawing with the ethos of drawing club that we just share our process. I want to invite you to draw along with our, our um, prompts and share on a pad, uh, a website for those who haven't used that before. And we'll put that link in the chat in a moment. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom who do a little mini intro to his process. Welcome, Tom. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, all right, so I'm looking at your messages. I'm just going to move down to my second screen. And I have a small presentation, or I'll show you part of it. But first, I want to say thanks to everyone. First, I want to say a big thanks to Anna for buying posters from our cartoon saloon store. <laughs> but also to John it's and Dan. It. John and Dan and Liv, everyone, for inviting me here today. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is to draw. Um, and it's been a big part of my career. And I'm always happy to share my love of drawing with everyone. So nice to be here. Thanks very much. I'll give you a really whistle stop uh, look through give you some kind of idea of where I my, my background is um whoops what's going on ah something strange that I can't seem to go through my slides let me try again something funny excuse me okay what happened there I, I'm just going to stop sharing and try again apologies Used to yeah technology huh we wanted something that worked but we got technology instead um that was the way okay so i've got slides now you can see those slides um, yes no uh, you're not seeing anything okay There's something wrong again just give us a second apologies um that's why i made our is everyone, uh, uh, key questions ready for when we're drawing for Tom? Here's Is screen, that... screen two. Everyone, sure. Everyone's very excited, by the way, Tom. They're all posting how excited they are in the, in the oh, chat. Good. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you should see my screen and my presentation now, yeah? Yes, yeah. It's yeah, a pencil right. and paper, okay. Yeah. Right, I'll, very, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll just yeah, spend 10 or, 10 or 15 minutes going through this. So this, I started out uh, as a teenager in Young Irish Filmmakers, and then I went to college to study uh, hand-drawn animation in Ballyferma College in Dublin. And that's where I met a lot of my uh, business partners. We still work together today. Paul Young and uh, Nora Toomey are my two main partners. This was our first studio, which was actually part of the Young Irish Filmmakers building, which was a kind of a loose workshop. It's still going today for, for kids to learn about filmmaking. But back in the 90s, just getting uh, a go on the equipment meant a lot to us you know getting the chance to use it but what I think keeps filmmakers going today is the real secret is it's about teamwork and about collaboration and the equipment and software changes but that that kind of collaboration continued on and we were lucky when we set up the studio um cartoon saloon we were kind of working out of our bedrooms in in college in Dublin and back here in Kilkenny where I grew up Young Irish Filmmakers office offered us some space to get started and what we did was in defiance of the fact that in uh year 2000 when we set up everybody was um saying that we should go into CG animation we wanted to keep going with hand-drawn animation and uh we bought a load of our we kind of took away a load of desks from Jimmy Murakami studio. He was an animator in Dublin who'd been making the animated series of the Teenage Mutant Turtles and things like that. And uh, he was shutting up shop. And so he was shaking his head in disbelief that we wanted to keep going with hand-drawn animation when everyone was getting into computer animation at the time. But we kind of made that our, our calling card, you know, and we would draw more and more on Cintiqs, uh, but we're still 
focused on, on drawing as the basis of everything we do in the studio. And then this is just a little um, photo of my very organized collection of sketchbooks. <laughs> um these are just some drawings from my sketchbook from back in yeah the early 2000s i've always been sort of drawing always trying to keep a sketchbook going drawing people these are my wife and my son and i did it do a series of self-portraits we used to we still do life drawing but now we have professional models these are from life drawing from back in the early days of the studio and we had to just pose for each other and uh and and sort of mend and make do these are some examples of my sketchbooks from my travels from over the years, over the last 20 something years. Um, maybe what's interesting here is after I made my first feature film, The Secret of Kells, um, I went on a retreat in a place called Plum Village in, um, in France. And it was a Buddhist meditation retreat. And I kind of made a connection then between drawing and mindfulness. And for me, the fact that drawing was a, a kind of a calming activity. So apart from practice being good for my professional work, it was also just good for my personal life. And I've been told by my wife, for example, that I'm a slightly nicer person if I spend a few hours drawing every day. And, and for me, generally, that means paper and pencil and paints and stuff. That's also part of what's calming. Because so much of my work is on, on screen. I don't tend to draw for fun on screen as much. Um, but that might be just a generational thing. I think a lot of people are just as good on uh, on screen as on paper. But for me, it's nice to take a break from the screen and draw on paper. But these are just some studies of my some of my favorite artists. And I think that's always an important thing in finding your style is to absorb as many of the people that you admire by doing studies. So these are studies of Egon Sheila, for example. One of them is kind of a fan art of David Bowie that I did around the time that Bowie died. He'd been important to me in my youth. So I did an Egon Sheila for version of Bowie. And then these are, you know, I love Gustav Klimt. So these are kind of Gustav Klimt's decorative pattern finding its way into my sketchbooks and into my professional work. These are examples of studies that I got paid to do because back when I was about 23, I got hired to do an illustrated graphic novel of the life of St. Patrick. And so I wasn't getting paid very much, but I used it as a way to do more studies. So nearly every panel in this graphic novel is in, inspired by or a study of a, a painting I was interested in learning more about. And I think some of the style that we became known for in our films, you can kind of see the, the, the ancestor of it in, the, in these comics. These were like my first professional work. Then they're in the Irish language as well. So. Maybe you won't be able to read them, but um, they were they were a really nice opportunity to do more drawing studies. And then this is another example of something that I recommend people do at, and never ends. You know, I was talking to Dan earlier and and John and, and Anna, and we were saying that you're always studying, I'm always studying. But uh, reverse storyboarding your favorite films, I think, is a really clever, good way to learn about everything from composition and and uh, screen direction to just studying faces and, and characters and acting. This is really interesting. I always like showing this slide because there's some drawings here in the corner by my son, who was 10 when he did that. So they're very old because uh, he's 27 now. But uh, he also seemed to, at 10 years old, study some of the important elements of these, this Wes Anderson movie, which was full of symmetry. You know, he, and I, I think he did a great job. So I always think it doesn't really matter if the drawing is perfect, as long as you've taken in the information that you're trying to get from the from the movie you're studying. Um, I'm gonna. Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna skip through this stuff because we don't have time. But these are are this. These are just a little presentation of some of the professional work I've done, and my first movie was Secret of Kells, and it still keeps me busy. With pencil and paper when people ask me to do little commissions or drawings so i'm still drawing the characters longer than i expected to and then on song of the sea it was similar it started in my sketchbook and a lot of my first ideas while i was working on secret accounts were these little paintings and studies i did um while we were working on secret accounts i was developing song of the sea and that was mostly a, a drawing exercise and i showed you my son earlier I based the main character on my son at the time when he was 10. So that was another way that my kind of personal drawing practice came into my professional work. 
Um, and of course, because we're mostly a hand-drawn studio, drawing is a really important part of um, the actual production of, of our films. I skipped over that. If you have time, go and check out On Love. There's a, a chapter of a movie called um, The Prophet um, by Kyle Gibran. And uh, that was a really great opportunity for me and, and Ross Stewart, who co-directed it with me, to take all the stuff that we loved and kind of pack it in to an animated film where we were able to really put on display where on our sleeves our influences like Clint and, and so forth. And then in Wolf Walkers, again, another project, my most recent project that kind of came from my sketchbook. So you can see the earliest beginnings of the project in my sketchbook. And also it was an opportunity for me to study more because I hadn't really ever, and I don't think I still really have, but I, I tried to get better at animal anatomy during that production by doing studies like this. So it was a nice opportunity. And again, because this was all happening while I was doing my my day job, I was think storyboarding on the breadwinner or doing some thumbnail storyboards for Nora on the breadwinner film she was directing. I was doing these paintings myself at home. So they were kind of my my switching off thing. And again, I based the main character on my wife when she was a little girl. So it was another way to bring some of my studies from my sketchbook into my professional work. But the thing I want to just point out about uh, Wolf Walkers is that Ross and I have both, like Ross is a painter and he spends a lot of his time just as a, as a fine art painter. We wanted to bring some of the language of painting and drawing into the movie. And so there's a very um, clear distinction in the in the movie between the world of the town and the settlers and the wild people and the, and the animals in the forest. And we wanted to use the kind of language of drawing to help tell the story. So we use very rough, scratchy lines to show show the characters that are wild and leave it looking like a, an animation line test. And then we went for something more like a, a woodblock print look for the for the town. So what we were hoping to do was to bring some of the energy and vitality of a sketchbook or a, a comic book uh, to screen um, rather than cleaning everything up and making everything perfect. We just liked the, the language of drawing and we tried to bring some of the language of drawing into the film itself. And that, that big time with the Wolf Vision, if you see that movie, it's on Apple TV or you can get the DVD or something. Or I'm sure there's other ways to watch it. Um, you'll see that when we see the world through the eyes of a wolf, we completely immerse ourselves in a kind of charcoal -y sketch world. Um, so that's just a little bit about the movies. And then this is the stuff that came after. But what basically happened then for me after Wolf Walkers, I uh, had a, like everyone, we all suddenly found ourselves in lockdown. And this drawing online, I think, is brilliant. I did a lot of it with the 2B or not 2B collective, which is part of the, the Royal College, I think. I don't know. I think Joanna Quinn or someone online posted about it, and that's how I found it. But I was also just drawing for myself. I was drawing my, my colleagues on Zoom meetings. Here you can see, like, I have boxes and boxes of these. It was a great way to practice. And I felt like lockdown was an opportunity for me to get better at traditional drawing. I'd started doing online courses in anatomy with Carl Ganass and stuff. But there's some famous people here on the screen that I was talking to that day. Um, and then, yeah, and these are also my sketchbooks, but I did an Inktober and the Inktober was just kind of for fun. I was illustrating a story that I that didn't, that I'd found in my research for Song of the Sea. But I wanted to illustrate it and I just did it for fun. And then as it turned out, when we did the comic book version of Song of the Sea, the publisher wanted an extra story. So I was able to just recycle my sketchbook, my Inktober. So that was nice. And then the, these are the online drawings, um, the online life drawings I did during lockdown. And um, I was studying anatomy and, and trying to improve my drawing um, during that period. And then um, that was, as everyone knows, that lockdown went on way longer than anyone expected. But it was a really good, um, I think for a lot of people, despite the fact it was such a tragic time for so many people, I think for a lot of us, it was a time to kind of quieten down a bit. And um, and for me, it was definitely a great opportunity to work on my drawing. And then I took a, a sabbatical after that and I went to Paris. And I studied in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, which is great life drawing room. And that was mad because I'd done whatever it was, 18 months or two years of drawing online. And then suddenly I found myself with a real model. And what was amazing was 
that life drawing room in Paris allows you to kind of climb up and walk along these um, kind of balconies and things and look down at the model from different angles, which was really important, and really interesting. I spent four months in Paris. I also went urban sketching with the architecture school in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which was a really nice way to be in the city and really see the city. And um, I think my drawing improved. I was really trying to work on fairly classical techniques. Um, and I don't know how it's going to impact my, my professional work, but I'm sure it will. It gets into your wrist, gets into your bones, and then you kind of can't help but have it come out in your everyday in your in your professional work, I think. So these are all just just all personal work from that time in Paris. I started painting again. I hadn't painted in years. Um apart from like illustration stuff. So just painting for myself again. I started with watercolors. And then I went to Amsterdam and I spent four months in Amsterdam studying oil painting, which I'd never ever done. I'd only ever played with watercolors. I never had any proper training in painting because I I studied animation and and by that I mean paper and pencil animation. So this was a lot, a really interesting and really invigorating time to go back in again. I was doing studies of Rubens um, and the studies are really helpful. And just getting my, getting used to the to the oil paint itself was a really interesting thing. And, and drawing a lot. I was drawing eight hours a day for two or three days a week while I was in Amsterdam, which was really, really valuable and really a privilege and a luxury because since college, I hadn't really had that much time to just draw. It was all the stuff I would do in the evenings or weekends or whatever. So it was a real luxury to have that much time. And I think my drawing improved a lot uh, during that period. And then some self-portraits. Um, momentum worry. All right. <laughs> Very quickly, yeah, these are just a few sneak peeks of the new projects I'm working on. I'm working on a project about the friendship between the Irish and the Choctaw Native Americans and the gift they sent us during the Irish famine, which um, it's been really interesting because I'm working with an artist called Waylon White Deer, who's a Choctaw painter. And uh, I'm learning a lot because so far all my films have been based on Irish folklore. And this has been really interesting to learn about Native American culture and folklore. And I'm also working on a, a short film with my wife about the tiger that escaped from the, the, the circus in Paris in 2017. And that's really fun because I'm going to have the story of the tiger walking around Paris represented by lots of different artists who all have different styles and, and they represent you know, different people's points of view and their imagination of the tiger in Paris. So that's been a really fun project again, just to explore further the all the techniques and possibilities of hand-drawn animation. All right. So there, and you can follow me on Instagram there, Tom9769. Oh, thank you for that, Tom. Can I just ask, The Tiger in Paris, is that a short film? or a short, short? It's a short. The idea yeah. is it's a short film and it's, it's uh, just uh, what, let's say, when I was in Paris, there was a, um, a kind of a local animal rights organization that were using maybe the tiger as their symbol, a bit like the, the panda in the World Wildlife Fund or something. Mm. And when I asked the story of the tiger, I just thought it was really interesting that on that day in 2017, more people saw the tiger and had a story than could possibly have seen her. So it was just really interesting to imagine all the different um, yeah, points of view. Wow, well, th thank you for sharing um, some of this work in progress. Um, could I get Dan? Dan, may, would you mind putting the Padlet link in? My Zoom's magically disappeared for a second. Yeah, exactly. So, everyone, we're going to draw, and Tom's going to share his screen, and we're going to start to draw from our Padlet references um, from Earth's world. Um, and, uh, so, I'll invite you to draw along with us and share uh, your work as you go, uh, and definitely at the end, so that we can. We can show what you've been up to to Tom and, and have a conversation. And as Tom draws, um, I'm going to pester him. Dan and I will pester and bug him with your questions. So if you don't mind, got into line of questions. That would be... Sorry. Yeah. And please try to stick those questions in as you can. Oh, sorry. Tom. We're, we're going to start with the Earth World references. Yeah. The, yeah, the... actually. D yeah. And may I invite like, anyone else who wants to turn their camera on, Dan and I and, and the rest of the team, Tom <laughs> as well, have their camera on. So if you want to draw us, maybe don't want to draw me, um, but you're welcome to. So if you want to have a self portrait done by Tom, I suppose, it's all what we're after, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, be nice to turn your cameras on in that, that theme of uh, 
Tom say during lockdown, drawing people on team and Zoom is quite fun. But otherwise, we'll, we'll um, draw on the us world. I will say that I'm notoriously unflattering in my drawings. So please don't be <laughs> upset if I draw you and it looks a little bit rough because I don't know why I have this tendency to go somewhere between um, uh, somewhere between a, a caricature and a, and a life drawing, you know. So that's just a, just a warning. I'm going to draw this lady. She looks very happy with the the um, yellow stripes on her on her jumper on her dress. And yeah, ask ask me questions while I draw. And you can, I guess, just by, I mean, the one thing I have to say as well is this isn't my normal way of drawing from observation. I usually draw um, on with a pencil and paper, but I guess I have some advantages here that I can. I can use from my professional life of resizing and stuff. Let's see how it goes anyway. It's not my... Can I, uh, can I be selfish, Tom, and ask the first question, please? Yes. <laughs> you know, host privileges. Uh, I just want to ask about um, your, oil, your oil painting uh, oh. experience, because uh, I've, I've got uh, dreams of trying oil paints, and I've never done it before. Uh, I've, I've dabbled like once um and i haven't been trained on it either so how did you find that did you find it really difficult no i find it i find it really lovely i i was so surprised how much i enjoyed it now i had done i had done a lot of life drawing and painting with watercolor to kind of warm up so i was kind of pumped and ready for it you know but i was scared going in and i had this like idea that oil painting was i don't know some kind of arcane art that only magicians could do and I realized it's a very forgiving medium like I was surprised it's more forgiving for sure than um watercolor you can kind of change things move things around I started I found a really good teacher um Raymond Hoosman who has an atelier in Amsterdam and he still paints in the old you know Rubens Rembrandt kind of way so with very limited palette which is actually nice you know a limited palette is a nice thing as well because you have less to think about and so I actually found it a really enjoyable experience and I just wish I'd started sooner and I and I kind of say to people don't be afraid of it because actually it's a material that was developed for especially for painting people you know and it, you get some effects for free with it that I didn't I never experienced before it looks really it can look really um, translucent and really like real skin if you just follow the kind of really the steps that have been worked out over the years by the Dutch painters, you know. Mm, and just sort of, uh, just sort of piggybacking it off the off the end of that, then um, your master studies is that did that really help as well? Because it's something that we always advise the students to do, and it's something that I try and do myself. And 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 honestly, it's just it's such a great way of like getting into the uh, under the skin of the artist and walking in their shoes and and being able to sort of follow their process in a way of like breaking down a painting and just seeing how they how they did it. It's so interesting, yeah, and it's definitely that. And 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 sometimes it feels a little bit like homework, but I always find a way in. And usually I'm um usually I'm humbled by it. And like by the time I'm finished, I think it's awful. And then if I put the original away and I just see what I did, I think, oh, it's not so bad. <laughs> but you know, when you're, when you're studying, you're just seeing everything that you're not like that's different, that you're not. Um, that you're not quite getting right but it, it definitely helps and it's definitely an enjoyable and interesting way to get under the skin of your favorite painters and the more you read about and understand about their way of working um, the more useful it is to just really take a, a close look at their work mm, cool thank you we might have some current second years in the, the in the um room here today we did we did a, a master study storyboard reverse of uh james cameron uh terminator 2 sequence oh um, cool wonder if we've got any feedback on that how you found that did it feel like homework as, as tom said um it was homework uh, i hope it was hard uh did you have a favorite film tom with that in mind you showed the real ten and bums as the uh, i like wes anderson's films because i feel like he he has a visual style that's very like uh, illustrative and the visual language is really clear in it I do love Wes Anderson's films, but actually my favorite live action movie of all time is Rocky. And I have reverse storyboarded most of it, but it's not yeah. the most, it's not the most visually spectacular movie. I just love it as a movie, you know, it has a lot of art. And uh, for some reason, it's just always been my favorite movie. Yeah. But in terms of study, you know, I study a lot of um, lately because I'm doing a film set in, in uh, 
you know, the 1840s in North America, I've been studying a lot of old like Westerns and things like that. It, it depends what I'm studying for. Mm. I think back when I used to do all my studies of Wes Anderson and stuff was like around the time I was just getting started as a director and I was tr trying to reverse engineer and figure out all the shot choices. Now I find it's more for, sometimes it's even more for color and composition ideas. But it's always useful as well, I think. And it's a nice way to really get under the skin and get to know a movie, you know. So almost universally, you work on pencil and paper or, or physical media for studies. You uh, you only use typically a digital for, for work, yeah, for final work. Yeah, outcomes. yeah. I think I'm a bit of a dinosaur. I think it's because I, I studied in the 90s in a school that was still teaching like the old classical animation way. And so it just became more natural for me. But... um. I went through a phase, I did an online, um, Mickey Montillo was one of the background artists in our studio and he had an online light and color course in Photoshop. And I did that and uh, during Wolf Walkers and I did find that useful too, but my first preference is with pencil and paper. Yeah. That'd be so, interesting, we, we have really insightful thoughts from the crowd. Um, most people still would, would study at school with uh, traditional media first and foremost and, and correct me if i'm wrong uh, audience but did, i just want a question to the audience do, do you do you think clearer in pencil and paper or you know physical media paint or do you um can you be as loose on digital or is someone does someone in the group uh, just generally prefer digital and you just are free there and in, in a way that you're not with pencil and paper might be nice to hear that that feedback sorry dan you might have had a, a question to read out or something oh. No, sorry, I, I just wanted to clarify, Tom, the course that you took from uh, the chap in the studio, was that one that he had made himself? No, it was part of CG Masters, I think. It was like yeah. an, on, an online thing. And yeah. he had um, he had taken it over from another concept artist. And uh, and I just wanted to brush, uh, not brush up, I never learned Photoshop. I kind of taught myself Photoshop, you know. Mm. And so I just wanted to do, it was really helpful. Yeah, oh, cool. Yeah, I think um, online courses, uh, especially these days, I mean, I, I'm always a big proponent of schoolism. Um, but yeah, CGMA is a great one, the one that you just mentioned. Um, and just before we hand over to the chat, because there's tons of questions coming in, I just wanted to ask you specifically, um, as a character designer myself, one of the things that I love about your work and the studio's work is the shape design is incredible. Um, oh. your, your films, like, I'm a big shape guy, and your designs are so rooted in that ethos i think um and i just wondered like where that came from and, and what your influences perhaps were or was it just something that you kind of gravitated towards over time uh, and develop yourself or what's the sort of story with with that i think so, really unique your films they're incredible yeah i think some of the like the the fine art influences that i showed there like sheila and clint were more evident in the backgrounds but they did have uh they do have a shape language you know but we were looking at just at the time, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were looking for a style that could kind of, at the time at least, could only be done in hand-drawn. I know now there's exciting stuff like Spider-Verse and everything. So it's like more, more about the, the way we spend our day now that we keep going with hand-drawn. But back then we thought we could come up with a style that was something very uniquely hand-drawn and maybe kind of timeless. But then in terms of the shape language, yeah, I think I was very influenced by Richard Williams uh, Thief and the Cobbler when I was in school yeah. when I was in animation school I found like a bootleg VHS of that and I loved the the design in that I loved Gendy Tartakovsky's uh, Samurai Jack and Clone Wars series that came out back then and then I loved Eastern European animation like especially the Hungarian folk tales from the Keshkemet studio and so they were very like based on folk art and they, the visual language and the shape language was really uh, precise you know um on those and then there was a Japanese film that had a big impact on us in the early days of the studio called the uh, little prince and the a-headed dragon and um it's kind of crazy it's like a it's a Japanese movie from the 60s kind of before anime was really anime you know like really in the early days and it was also based on Japanese folk art and uh really really big influence on us if you find it you'll see and the son of the white mare from Hungary um, Marcel Yankovic, people like that had a big influence and impact on us. You know. So I guess the takeaway from that is, you know, influences from everywhere, right? 
not just your own culture and not just your own um you know uh, time period and it's like just look at everything and be inspired by it take as many in take, to get as much stuff in to you as possible because the more you mix it up it becomes your own if you just directly copy one artist then you're just copying one artist but if you take on board aspects of a whole school or different types of artists the more unique what you'll get back will be of course your own filters in there too your own preference and your own taste is important but I think a lot of people focus a lot on finding their style when they're young and I think you're better when you're young just to study a lot of people that you like and your style will become kind of the the lowest common denominator of what you can absorb so I'd rather people I mean well, I recommend people don't think too much about little surface details that define your style but rather a whole approach that can design define your style you know as it as it were like looking for shape language or looking for color language or rendering or whatever but an overall approach rather than well my style is i draw eyes in a certain way you know because that's very limiting mm, yeah so be a sponge basically definitely yeah and keep evolving hopefully our stuff i mean people think we have a very recognizable style but i think we have a very recognizable approach and I feel like from one project to the next, we change the style a lot. You know, it's just our approach, our underlying aesthetic is always there, but the actual style um, evolves, I hope. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah should, we, should we open, uh, should we throw questions at Tom from the chat, John, I think, because there's time. Yeah, definitely. We, yeah. we might um, kind of summarize some of the thoughts when I asked that question. Uh, the majority of people saying they, clearly uh, enjoy pencil and paper to do their first drafts, their thinking pass. Um, I, I maybe have a similar thought to you, Tom, that maybe thinking I'm a dinosaur and prefer to work on pencil and paper. Um, and I'm aware, you know, a generation of people um, obviously graduate who are confident digitally and can think creatively digitally, but yeah, many, many people in the audience saying um, pencil and paper is their go-to uh, or physical media even. Uh, do you want to pick on a question uh, or yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I'll just go, I'll go straight from top to bottom, actually. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Anais asks, um, do you have any advice on keeping cartoon work bouncy and fun after lining and colour? I tend to lose the work's flow and intrigue after the sketch has been drawn over. I'd really appreciate any thoughts on how to keep them flowy and dynamic. So I guess, yeah, um, how to keep your, 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 that gesture in, in your work when you're doing the tie downs, I suppose. Yeah, it's a big thing that we work on in the studio a lot. Um, with with the, we try not have a clean up department, but rather like a final line department. You know, so I I'm terrible at clean up, and some of the other movies that we've done have really precise clean up. Like Nora is a good clean up artist, and I think she likes a a tight final line. If you see on the, my father's dragon, but I always try to keep it feeling like a drawing. So my advice whenever I'm working on assistant work is to don't don't change mode and think, oh, now I'm just tracing. Try and keep it a drawing, you know, try and keep feeling it like a drawing. And if you're drawing skin, think about skin. If you're drawing, you know, a pair of glasses, make sure the light, like, it's just, and it's almost like comic book inking, you know, it, it's, it's an approach to the tie down. That's more a continuation of the approach you had in the, in the animation stage, rather than a totally other Part of your brain where you just go perfect line perfect line perfect line because that does kill it you know like the lines might be perfect but you've lost some character or something in it so yeah it's about a, a mental state i think you know cool thank you yeah that's great um let me just pick another one do, 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 do. okay so azahara hello asks um so well, they say i'm a big fan of your movies uh, when you use folklore in your work, how deep do you delve into it? Do you stay within the interpretation iteration that everyone's familiar with, or do you add as many details as possible of other tellings of the same folklore? After all, they are a mythology and thus have multiple versions and iterations. Yeah, my I, I early on, if you watch the movie Song of the Sea, there is a character in it called the Great Shanaki, and he's uh, based on a guy called Eddie Lennon, who's um storyteller from down in, in County Clare here in Ireland. And Eddie, um, I met Eddie early on because when I was a kid growing up, he had a thing on Irish TV called the 10 Minute Tales where he would tell the stories, but he would mix up, you know, characters from like 
ancient pagan Irish myths with like St. Patrick and stuff. And I asked him about that. And he said, well, that's our, there are stories to retell. And so he was retelling them. They're not a gospel. They're not written down, you know, like Yeats or Lady Gregory or anybody who wrote down the Irish stories in the 20th century. They were just telling their version of it, you know, during the Celtic revival and it had been retold and retold. And I think it's true of all mythology that it's like a living language and so what I try and do is get into those stories and see what are the I almost go on a shopping trip you know like I almost go like well what are they what's in them what's the kind of truth in them that I feel resonates today so that it can continue to um be interesting for me to use it as a basis for a feature film that might take me four or five years so usually I try and find a personal way in so for me the Selkie stories in Song of the Sea were a little bit like um to me, they seem to be about loss, you know. I was interested in the fact that they seem to be about loss and a little bit about, um, well, for me, they were a, they had a personal resonance and it might have a different resonance to another person. Like someone else might read those Selkie stories and have it and take away a totally different interpretation. And I'd love to see another person tell it, you know, a Selkie story or any of those stories. So for me, I'm very loose about how, how faithful I am to whatever retelling of it is and I kind of retell it for my audience with my point of view in mind and I feel very kind of um connected to the story if I can find what the the kind of painful truth is like what's the thing that kept this story relevant and being retold and remembered all these years you know and that's how you keep the stories alive because someone else might retell them in a totally different way with a different angle and so they're kind of endlessly rediscoverable that way rather than there being one absolute definitive version in fact i think that's kind of sad when sometimes disney take a fairy tale and they make their version of it and that becomes the definitive version of the fairy tale i think that's such a pity i think we lose a lot because it's just one set of storytellers and they're retelling of it you can yeah. make the uh, connection there tom with the design you mentioned you know, someone just working in their design or find their design quite early on is there a connection between that, that, you know, your your visual language, the same as your storytelling language, that it's about what you find the essence of that and remix it and combining and, um, yeah, yeah, you know, you know, just about the idea of a young artist, I think, I think you were phrasing it, trying to find a design too quick and working in one way. That's yeah. about, um, similar, yeah. similar to the storytelling. Keep, keep it open. Just, and keeping open to think, discovering things along the way, like my first interpretation of a, of the folklore might change as I go deeper into it and read more versions of it or find more versions of it, or even just telling the story myself, it might need to be something else. So in Consong of the Sea, it's a good example. I had so many references and ideas in that uh, idea, like in that initial outline, that it would have been just way too bloated. And Will Collins, the, the screenwriter, and I kind of decided at a certain point to simplify all the fairy tale aspects into things that reflected what was going on for the actual family. And so characters like Maka, the witch and all really just became a mirror of what was happening for the grandmother or the giant became like a mirror of what was happening for the dad. And in that way, the folk tales were very relevant to the family. You know, they were very it was a, there was a human story that didn't require you knowing anything about Irish folklore to kind of get it. And then if you're interested, you can go and find out the real stories of Manana MacLear or Maka, the, the war goddess, and all those characters kind of, we, we adapted them for our story, you know. And, and that's the way folklore, at least Irish folklore seems to be. There's versions of Irish folklore, and I think it's true of all mythology. There's versions of Irish folklore where, you know, someone, a character like Finn McCool is the hero, and there's other versions of it where he's the villain, you know. And um, it all just depends on the story being told, when it's being told, who it's being told by, and who it's being told for. Yeah, do you want to jump to the next question? Yeah, we've got so many questions on yeah um what, one that's kind of um yeah from daisy uh one that's more being brought back to studying and things um daisy says i'm currently studying in sixth form and i'm debating about what to study at university my dream career as a freelance illustrator if you studied at university what course did you study this is for you tom obviously and how did you get into your line of work or job well i don't 
like I mean the college I went to it's a great college and I think if you go there now you can get a degree or whatever um, but I'm sure your college is a really good college too so I don't tend to recommend colleges but I went to Ballyferma College literally because that was where they were teaching at the time kind of classical animation that I was interested in and they did a lot of drawing in it and I think early on I kind of thought well I'll go here and get good at drawing and maybe I'll be a comic book artist or a tattoo artist or I had a few other ideas of what I might do I never got a degree you couldn't get a degree back then in classical animation and I regret that and I think I would have liked to have studied more broadly I wish that like I went straight in to learn how to be an animator in the style of, you know, Don Bluth or whatever. And I was 17. And when I look back on it, the one thing I wish I'd done is studied art more broadly, you know. Um, but I kind of had to learn on the job then because I, I started the company while I was in college. And most of what I learned until last year when I went to do Call the Bazaar was learned on the job, you know. But um, yeah, I think, do you know what I think? Young Irish filmmakers, I always say this, Young Irish filmmakers and Valley Firma College, as much as I learned from the teachers there, I learned a huge amount more from my 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 classmates, like the people I was um, working with. And there was a huge amount that I learned about collaboration. I think college is really important for learning to work with other people and kind of getting out of your bedroom and working in a team or from your bedroom, I guess, these days. But, you know, working in a team and there's a whole lot of soft skills and stuff that you learn in college as well as whatever hard skills you learn. And I think they're just as important because the industry is always changing, but working with other human beings seems to be a constant, you know. Yeah, and a skill, very importantly. Uh, like really important skill. Yeah, and so that's an important skill. Uh, and we have people in the studio who retrained, like there's one woman who's making her um, animated TV series with us, and she came in as a producer, and she'd gone back to college to study after spending... She was 36 when she went back to college because she'd been an optician and ran, had run her own opticians. You know? and there was people who were architects and, you know, people came from all kinds of backgrounds. And the thing, the common thing that made it for me, made them be a good addition to our studio was that they were able to work with with a team and work with others and be a, a team player, you know, no matter what their background was. So also, uh, sorry, Tom. Awesome. And also there's, um, you know, those people have that um, experience, right? So they can bring their, um, the lady in question can bring her experience as a optometrist or running her own business into, you know, the studio in some way. And it's all about getting that pool of different life ex experience and then like filtering all into the, into the productions, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And we have people who are like absolute specialists and they travel around Europe and the world wherever there's the latest hand-drawn project and they're kind of more interested in it being hand-drawn than anything else and then we have people who are just willing to have a go at whatever is needed and they jump from one job to another in the studio and they might be doing something with you know harmony a rigged animation for tv and then jumping onto a hand-drawn feature film and so there's there's kind of different roles you know there's people who stay in the studio and change role and people that keep the same role but go from studio to studio because they're specialists, you know, so there's no one fixed way to come into the business. Cool. Uh, I'm just going to look for another question. If, if you've got, have you got one, John, in the meantime? Sorry, I'm sorry, there. Let me jump on the questions. Who did we just ask? Uh, yeah, I'm just hang on a second. I'm just going down. Uh, uh, Freya says, what characteristics do you look for to create character design? Um, a big question, but uh, is there a kind of go-to characteristic at the moment? Or, or characteristic? Um, yeah. Usually, I have a. I usually, as I was saying briefly in the presentation, I have a sort of an idea that I wanted to look, or to look like, or be based on a real life person, somebody I know, and sometimes it's a combination of several people. Um, and that's really important to me because then it gives me a hook that I can feel like I know the character. And often I design the characters before I've even finished writing the script or working out the story. I kind of get to know. And sometimes things change. Like Robin in Wolfwalkers was a little boy. And I designed a little boy character and everything. And then we decided, oh, it makes so much more sense if it's a little girl. And when I hit on the idea of basing that character on my wife, 
I was I was like, oh, now I know who this person is. I can imagine how she'd react in certain in instances. And like with Ben in Song of the Sea, you know, it became a very simplified design, but it started with sketches of my son. He has a little gap in his teeth and stuff. So, you know, little things like that can help make your character more real, I guess, if you base it on some. Sometimes I base it a little bit on the actor that plays the voice. Um, and then generally I have shape language, as you were saying earlier. Generally, I, I try to find uh, a, a dominant shape that the character is based on. And that's usually part of a broader scheme, a broader shape language that I might have in mind, you know, uh, whether that's like Saoirse is very much based on the circles and curves, while her brother Ben is all kind of rounded off squares and stuff. Or in Wolf Walkers, it's very obvious that the, the Puritans and the people in the town are all geometric and have hard lines, outlines and, and shapes that are very angular. And then the people in the forest are more sketchy and way less um, angular, you know? So those are things I think about. Is it, uh, did you say that the writing process goes hand in hand with character design? So do, do the characters visually present uh, story opportunities and, and change the writing? Or is it always script first for you and then design? And definitely design first for me. Usually I find my way into this stuff through sketchbook drawings. And like characters like Saoirse arrived before I even had the story worked out. You know, I, I knew what she looked like and then I was trying to figure out the exact details of the story. So, but then, yeah, sometimes it changes. Like I was saying, sometimes the writing process necessitates that we change a character. And um, that can be hard because for me, sometimes I kind of have... I almost feel like I know what the character looks like and changing it is changing who the character is. But I always try and find like a way in by thinking about who would I cast for this? Or, you know, is it based on somebody I know in real life or whatever? Uh, as a horror ask, um kind of follow-up question. Um, I noticed that each film of the Irish Folklore Trilogy have a texture that fits the setting. Secret of Kells is inky most of the time, very clean and bold lines, like the illuminated text. Song of the Sea has a lot of watercolour textures and it makes sense of the sorry, uh, of the film as the film is themed on the ocean and Wolf Walker's sketchy charcoal pencil lines towards earthy, like the soil of a forest. Was that done on purpose or a happy accident that came from looking at for an aesthetic to fit the narrative? Uh, I would say it was a happy accident that we went looking for on purpose, you know. I think mm -hmm. early on with Secret of Kells, we had this idea of using ink as our kind of um, visual motif or whatever. Um, but then we also, because we were looking a lot at the actual illuminated manuscripts from that time period and stuff that had an influence on it too. And yeah, all that, all that was pretty well um, observed. Yeah, good, good work. <laughs> you, yeah. Figured this, you figured this out. Yeah. Um, Sydney asks, what would the ultimate dream project be? Uh, or would you like to make? Oh, it's always the next one I'm going to make. Like right now I'm thinking a lot about the new project Kindred Spirits and I'm really interested in like Native American culture and folklore and that that's going to be a dream to get to make that and to work with more Native artists and everything like that so yeah I always like to learn about a new culture or try and find a new art style whenever I can on a new project you know and the, the dream project is always the next one I guess <laughs> Did you get calls to to not retread? Oh, obviously, you've done the trilogy, but um, did you find your people come calling for you for your style and um, uh, you know, maybe want you to repeat, or or are you as a studio able to just constantly change and update and and have the, do you, do you have the freedom to to go adventure into new visual storytelling territories? Uh. Yeah, I think we're starting to see there's an like early on we were pretty agnostic and we kind of were guns for hire and sometimes we'd you know do a TV commercial and they would ask us to make it in the style of I don't know The Simpsons or whatever and we would just do that. Now more and more people come to us for the kind of aesthetic that we're associated with in our in our own work, you know. So like recently Paul directed the uh, an episode of Visions for Star Wars. And uh, he used a lot of the team and a lot of the ideas and techniques from Wolf Walkers, but he kind of pushed it into his own a uh, little bit 
more into his own kind of um, style, which is definitely more ink and wash, and he draws a lot with a with a dip pen and stuff. But basically, that was Lucasfilm coming to us based on Wolf Walkers, and so he wasn't going to deviate too much from the Wolf Walkers style. But he was going to bring some of his own to it. So we don't want it to become a trap that we can only do. We don't want to be like too typecast, but at the same time, we see the value in continuing to work in our own kind of recognizable style, you know. Yeah. Be nice good to break question. out of it. Yeah, it's a good question. Like we 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 developed stuff, but we've never actually produced too much. But we have developed stuff, like even for live action and and at different yeah. times we talked about puppets and stop motion. But I think what keeps on happening is the culture of the studio is very much based on the last project. You know, it's a bit like being a chain smoker. You like the next one off the butt of the previous one. So each project ends up being a kind of an evolution from the previous one. And so I can kind of see an ancestry to our films going back to Secret of Cows without a big break or change of style ever. You know, it's always been a kind of evolution rather than a big about face, you know. Wow. Really good. Uh, so Jamie asks, I love your films. Wolf Walkers is one of my favourites. May I ask, did you find any difficulties or learning curves when you first became a director? Story was really hard. Yeah, I think I, I was always really into the art side of it, but I don't think I was prepared for the story um, challenges. Um, and they didn't realise how often that the story kind of has to be broken apart and put back together again. So I think I learned a lot on Secret of Kells about, about story and tone. I think tone is another big thing for me because it feels like um, a, a movie is more about the feeling it leaves you with than the individual details of the plot, you know? So I think um, thinking about the tone and being consistent with the tone in the movie is really important because you might forget even the characters' names, but you probably remember how the movie made you feel. And... And especially for kids movies if it's one of the first movies they've they've watched or one of the few first movies they've watched definitely my memory of some of my favorite kids movies definitely the tone the overall um vibe of the movie lasted way longer than the details of the plot you know yeah i, I relate it to a dream like you wake up from a dream the real feeling and sensation that dream but the individual Sometimes aspects do pop out, but um, that's a great example. Yeah, kind of after yeah. Nice to steal that. Um, nice steal everyone, that. Uh, yeah, I've got a comment. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> um, he's drawing Dan. Oh, Freya says you're drawing Dan. Um, let's try to find your question. Um, I'm glad that cleanup art is an actual job in the industry, though, as so also it sounds. I also really like art rendering and cleaning up lines. Sorry, that wasn't a question, but Joe, that's a good comment. Yeah, clean up. Um, is is a job you said you don't like that Tom but you happily have a team of people who do love that is it a certain type of artist who likes clean up um not just a junior role is it to come in it's actually quite skilled isn't it but do you find it's a certain mental makeup of a person that really enjoys that tight drawing of clean up yeah definitely and people that are kind of humble in a way because the animators get a lot of kind of you know Credit, but it's actually the cleanup artist's line that's on screen, you know, it's their drawing that's on screen. Our head of cleanup, John Walsh, is like an old warrior of hand drawn animation. He was in Disney, Florida, and he, you know, he was, you know, everywhere back in the day. And now he's a bit older than me, even. And so he kind of brings a, a certain gravitas to the to the role. And I think he has his his posse of uh, artists that uh, look up to him a lot and a lot of them are assistants on their way to being animators but there's plenty as well that are happy in that role and I always try and lionize it as I say as a very important role and not a secondary role or a job that you do until you get to be an animator I think it's a really important because it's what ends up on screen you know and I think as much as you can for an animator to do their own cleanup the better because then you understand what you're asking an assistant to do later you know whereas if you only ever did rough animation and pass it off to someone else to do the final line i don't think you fully understand how much work is involved in that in that process you know yeah um so uh, a lot of love for the star wars visions in the chat sorry dan you go no i was just gonna i was just gonna take a uh, Taking the question, sorry. Uh, 
do, do, do. Uh, um, I had a good one. Uh, oh, Reggie asks, how do you deal with exhaustion or burnout when it comes to your work? Um, yeah. It's a really hard question. Yeah, I think I worked through a few burnouts in my early days before I even knew such a word existed and what was going on. But um, I tend to try and go back to the source all the time, which is why I went to Paris after Wolf Walkers to study life drawing and then to Amsterdam, because I was kind of getting back to why I wanted to do this in the first place. And just drawing just for myself without it being for a client or for a project or for anybody else was really healing for me you know um but yeah that's a hard one because it is a tough game and we're hard on ourselves and then it's a business that's hard on us so i do know that burnout is a very real um you know issue in the business and uh, I, i'm kind of happy in a way that the younger generation as i see it that come into the studio seem to be a lot more uh, conscious of emotional intelligence and how important all that is and they take better care of themselves I think I think there was a bit of a a, a kind of a toxic grind culture when I first came out and there was this kind of sense that you know I hero worship people like Dick Williams and Hayao Miyazaki and now when I read about you know their attitude to their work of course I admire the work but I wonder did they lose a little something human along the way <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> from driving themselves and their teams so hard you know and I'm not sure like definitely Hayao Miyazaki is a hero in terms of animation I'm not sure if he's a hero in terms of you know being a great father or a great <laughs> boss or anything like that I think when you watch the documentaries he's pretty tough on his son and pretty tough on his um, crew and I, I'd hope to be a bit more human than that you know yes yeah, it's, it's that work-life balance right and like you say um with filmmakers like that that are, that are legendary and they've given us some amazing projects you do sometimes wonder you know what has been lost along the way from a personal perspective and and, and ultimately you know was it worth it um and not saying for them but certainly people in the industry that, that do grind themselves into the ground and burn themselves out and then they the danger is that they just lose the love for drawing and they lose that love yeah. for art and it becomes this thing that they associate with such a negative feeling that they never touch it again and you kind of think, what a tragedy that is, <laughs> you know. It's really sad, isn't it? It's really sad that people, and my mum my worried about that for me. Like, she worried would I be um, losing my kind of, my hobby, like the thing that relaxed me. And she wasn't wrong. I, I mean, as much as I love the fact that I get to work in animation, and there's so many things I love about it, there's been plenty of times I've wondered if I should have, being a tattoo artist or a comic book artist or something else because it's a uh, it's a lot more than just drawing you know and, uh, the drawing part of it yeah can be kind of lost or kind of ruined by people know when I pin them eh? they so they can tell if I if I'm drawing them or not right you know Freya right oh, sorry that's the worst and I, I'll do a bad job sorry don't take don't take offense I'm just scribbling here <laughs> interesting the Miyazaki talk though and uh, not to focus on Miyazaki but um the idea that we're generating these stories that will communicate with audiences but uh, I do question sometimes do these companies do do these storytellers actually practice what they preach um it's all about harmonious communities and loving uh -huh. one another but if you're <laughs> we're working in a studio yeah, and, and know. Also, when it's you know the irony or the Boy, I used to make the joke, I hope people enjoy this movie in inverse proportion to the fun we had making. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it is, it's tricky, it's hard and people are driven and people want to do a good job. And and one like there's different stories in every movie. Like some movies, there's a story of how hard it was to get it made, but and then there's a story of what happens afterwards, and then there's the you know, there's different stories. But one story I always think is interesting is that different people can have different experiences on the same movie, depending and where they are in their career trajectory or you know what's going on for them so that can be that can be really interesting like I hear like say someone who was the the rock star animator on a movie will tell me it was the greatest experience of their life but somebody who was just totally underappreciated and worked their arse off and was never even recognized for all their work then they can say oh I'm never doing that again I'm burnt out and getting out of the business and it's the same movie you know with the same director and the same management so 
it's a tough game. It's a lot of people, a lot of lives. And artists are sensitive folks, you know. So, so yeah, I do. I, mean, I read Turning Point a few years ago, the Miyazaki autobiography. And, you know, I, as I say, as much as I admire him, I wouldn't like to work for him, you know. <laughs> Um, Linda asks in the chat, uh, I find your films, in, your films immersive and a joy to watch. I really enjoy the fine details in the background as well as the characters. How important are these details when you, your work is developing? So I suppose the question is how, how minute a detail, maybe how specific are you um, at developing background elements? The, uh, the only thing I really focus on in the development phase is uh, if it's got a story reason, you know, and then it's iterative, like a lot of that stuff builds up. So, I mean, every you try and make everyone feel like a filmmaker in the process. So I'm definitely not the sort that has every single thing figured out at the beginning. And I just need people to, um, you know, execute my commands or something like a load of robots. So often some of the stuff that you might love in the movie might have nothing to do with me, really. It might have been suggested by someone in the background team along the way. And then we thought it was good and we incorporated that into the into the look and you know what I mean like so it's very collaborative so some details for sure like they're really important to me and really specific and then some details are um we just find them along the way you know um, oh and he says yeah I think Miyazaki walked out of his son's first film that's uh, what I was that's what I was referring yeah. to I was like ouch <laughs> I love seeing Comparisons of him and Jinji, uh, Jinji Ito versus their work. Quite interesting to see. Um, okay. uh, George says it would be awesome if you do end up making a comic, Tom. I'm sure of it. Have you have you made a comic? Tom? I think you've you've made comic adaptations, haven't you? From season yeah, season. I'm I'm doing ca comic adaptations of all the trilogy now for um, for the states. So I did some for France and Belgium, and I always like to add some original stories like the one from song of the sea and i'm more thinking that i might do like say kindred spirits i might try and do that as a graphic novel first before i do the movie of it and kind of figure out as much as i can in that format this is a bit miyazaki i know and then kind of adapt my own comic that would be nice but um other than that the only comics i've done were those ones i showed at the start the, the saint patrick Two, I did two comics about the life of St. Patrick with an Irish language publisher 23 years ago or something, so I haven't done much comics other than that. Well, I guess the um, the reverse storyboarding is going to help, right, with that, Tom? I mean, I, yeah. uh, just in terms of, you know, composition and things like that. And, and so also just based off the back of that, um, any advice for anybody that wants to learn comics? Because, you know, I... Would it be doing film studies or would it be like copying comic pages, do you think, and comic page layouts just to learn about, you know, reading flow and that sort of thing? Like, I mean, comics is a broad medium. What I think is maybe sad is that a lot of comics have become just storyboards, you know, people. And I've heard people say it like, oh, I couldn't get this made as a movie, so I'm just going to do a comic of it as if it's like some kind of booby prize. Whereas I think comics are an art form in themselves. Like my favourite artists are people like Chris Ware, you really use the medium, you know, to its advantage. And so for me, if I was to get really serious with comics and not just do these like adaptations, which are great and fun, and I like doing something extra, but if I was going to really seriously get into comics, I'm, I'm much more interested in the more um, people that are really using the medium and telling stories that could only be told in comics rather than you know the kind of comics which are also fun but they're the ones that are being written with if one eye on oh maybe this will be adapted into a movie you know um they're, they're very different and i think there's a different approach to two different types of storytelling definitely there's people who have to and i have friends i went to college with who draw for marvel and stuff and they are definitely churning out pages and they're way closer to storyboard artists than you know fine artists like Chris Ware who's kind of pouring over details on every page and really adjusting his layouts to the even the paper stock or whatever he you know he visits the printer and makes sure that the colors are right and everything like that and then there's a whole other like attitude to comics where it is just a testing ground for a, a bigger project mm. like there's a great comic book artist called Brendan McCarthy I think 
I met him in LA and I used to read his comics when I was a kid. He used to draw Judge Dredd and stuff. But I mean, he's a phenomenal storyboarder. He practically storyboarded all of Mad Max Fury Road on his own. Yeah. And and his comics are so dynamic and so um, kinetic that they just beg to be trans, you know, made into movies. Whereas other comic book artists are more about the, the page. Or someone like Jeff Smith, I think, is a really good example of an, an animator bringing animation sensibilities to comics. He did Bone. And he's done more comics since then. Um, mm. But my favourite comics are more like, you know, um, Love and Rockets by the Hernandez brothers or Chris Ware's Jimmy Corrigan. Those kind of comics. Or maybe some of Alan Moore's stuff I like as well. Mm. Yeah, do, do you, um, I was, well, two things, Mad Max Free Road, what an amazing film, if nobody's seen that one. <laughs> do yourself, do your eyeballs a favour and watch Mad Max Free Road and then, uh, you know, do some studies from it. But also, uh, do you have a favourite comic book character? Tom, you mentioned Judge Dredd there. I remember reading 2000 AD quite a lot when I was a kid. Um, it was always one of my favourites. But do you have a favourite or is it just kind of like whatever the story, you know, whoever's... Like, as a, as, a, as a kid, I was absolutely blown away at the age of 11 by Michael Keaton's Batman in the Tim Burton movie and uh, I read Batman comics obsessively as a kid and I still have a soft spot for a Batman comic you know but like at a certain point I stopped reading the the monthly comics and maybe might read the odd graphic novel but um, now when I pick up a comic it's usually something kind of independent and offbeat <laughs> like i read a comic recently that i recommend to anybody to read and um, that's called ducks ducks about um about um a girl oh she did hark a vagrant she's an amazing canadian cartoonist but she spent years paying off her student loan working in the tar sands of canada and I, then i read joe sacco's um book which is more of a he's more like a comics documentarian he did safe area garage Day and stuff like that and and they both approached the same subject matter but joe sackles was from the point of view of the native people who were, there was a lot of debate within native communities about the use of their tar sand lands in canada and then she kate beaton was her name she had an experience as a woman in a very male dominated industry working in those tar sands and it was kind of depressing to see how men behaved under those conditions um, and both were an insight to the same phenomenon in, and uh, and I don't think either of them would have made sense in any other form other than as a comic you know so mm. I love I love books like that. Mm. There's a um, just before we ask another question Tom you just reminded me there's a I, I read a great one recently a great graphic novel called The Many Deaths of Layla Starr I don't know if you've oh. heard of it no i haven't it's it's incredible oh, it, it's about the the story in a nutshell is um death uh, who is a who's a lady um gets fired from a job in heaven uh, and sent down to earth to, to live as a mortal and she um somebody's going to be born on earth who's basically going to invent immortality and she's got this choice about whether to go and kill this uh this person you know to to give herself a job again if you like or to kind of um you know amazing uh, uh, yeah it. and and the art style is just it's so good i'll post a link to it in the chat for everybody um it it's, it's 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 just i i don't cry at, at books ever but this it was the first graphic novel that i'd ever read that that made me tear up at the end because it's all about wow. spirituality and it's really wow. beautifully illustrated it's so quirky the colors are amazing oh i'm gonna check that out for sure thanks that sounds like a yeah. great tip just oh, your 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 um, cover notes description of it makes me think back in the nineties. Mm. I used to read the Sandman. Did yeah, you know, game yeah. Sandman. Death was a character in that too. She was like a, a cute goth girl or something. Yeah, let me mm. just pop this in the chat, for people. Sorry, you can carry on asking questions now, John. Oh, uh, thanks for that. Then look forward Ooh. to checking that comic. Yeah, dramatic questions. Yeah, uh, Sydney mentions how. Mad Max was storyboarded instead of uh, written. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it goes. It was apparently George Miller tells the story of telling the um, studio they have to fly to Australia to see the storyboards on the wall because there's no script. It's like physical. Um, nice. Man, let's type it up because it's so visual. And uh, my kids aren't going to thank you. We have a running joke how much I watch Fury Road. So I'm going to watch oh, it tonight to annoy them <laughs> after that. Um, Kate Beaton, someone shout out to Kate Beaton, Elizabeth, 
mentions Kate Beaton. I think that's a comic book guy. Sorry, I don't recognize that name. Um, that's, who, that's who wrote Ducks. I yeah, was talking about the book about oh, she was yeah. the girl who worked in the in the tar sands. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to show that. Concentrate on my little doodles. Um, what was the title of the graphic novel? So that was Ducks, I think, George. I think that's what you're asking. I need to read Sandman, bought it at Christmas, says George. Uh, yeah, it's worth worth it. Actually, for the writing, maybe more than the art a lot, I think. Mm. Vladimir mentions death. Sorry, Discworld. Death. Oh, yeah. Oh, so the representation of this. Death in Discworld. Scanning through your notes, everyone. Um, we'll do a few more minutes to draw, and then we'll, we'll invite Tom to come check out your Padlet. Uh, I'm sure you're probably seeing things pop up, aren't you, Tom? I haven't go. seen anything uh, yet. Any... Padlet. Oh, this is what this is where I'm drawing from, is it? Oh yeah, I and I feel like oh, live awesome. below, oh awesome. Oh awesome. Wow, on. that's so great. I just updated it. Those are awesome. Holy shit. Ooh. Uh oh, Leif, I'll ask you a question. Um sorry, I missed that earlier. So Leif says, if you don't mind, uh, uh, when you decide a character, sorry, when do you decide a character design is done or when you can you finish working on it? Um oh. Is that just but is that just schedule or, or do you, do you ever do you ever finish them or do you feel they're abandoned and they're as good as they can the, be at the time? Character the character designs continue to evolve for me because what I do is I try and have like a, a pretty open approach that I have you know I but what tends to happen is because you have several people working on the project that you let go of it as a design and it becomes like a model sheet. And there's even a team in the studio, a really amazing team, who kind of break down the designs and try and figure it out so that everyone can draw it the same. And like, th like that's a nice ambition, but it never really happens. And usually there's an animator or an artist in the layout posing department or something who draws the character in a way that's really nice that I really like. And usually I try and update the model sheets with their work. So usually by the end of the movie, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've hit the character design <laughs> properly, but, uh, you know, and you can see it in some movies more. If you watch Wolfwalkers, you can see the Lord Protector character design changes a lot during the movie because I think it got better and we kept on kind of, uh, you try not to go so far that it becomes unrecognizable, but character design continues to evolve a little bit. Uh, I like to let the character design evolve a little bit. When I was younger, I wasn't like that. On Secret of Cows, I got really upset by it being different all the time and changing and being off model and all like that but actually in the end i think um it's part of the charm of hand-drawn animation that you can feel different artists hands you know it's a it's a balance i guess you don't want it to be so far off model that it doesn't look like itself the character doesn't look like themselves anymore but i really like the way an artist like federico pervano who was like an italian intern in the studio drew the wolf walkers designs that ross and i had done for years and he came in as an intern and we just liked the way he drew. So we said, OK, let's make new model sheets with Federico's slight variation on the characters, you know. I think with that vibe, I might know the answer though uh, to this, but I've always wondered, was there a budgetary or or concern about the two different styles? You know, was that um, a cost implication? The matter was it so mm -hmm. integral to the story that you couldn't tell it without the two different techniques? It just didn't matter. <laughs> Uh, we were look. I think Wolf Walkers was an opportunity because it was ten million was the budget, and Song of the Sea and Secret of Kells had been around five million. So Ross and I felt this was our opportunity to really go to town. Of course, we went over budget again, but um, it, we felt like okay, it's going to cost more, but this is our. And it wasn't just that; it was like at every level we tried to do all the things that we'd wished we could have done in the previous movies. And so, like moving the camera through the forest to show the, the wolves' point of view and all of that stuff was kind of crazy. But yeah, having the two different line styles was a part of the pitch, you know, was part of how I pitched the story right from the beginning that I wanted to, to make a film that used the language of drawing to tell the story. So thankfully, we had a few willing um, partners that were willing to go along with that. There was a there was a question about voiceover artists. I think before that I don't think we asked that one. Let me just try and find it. Uh, oh, here we go. Um, we haven't asked that one yet, have we? No, no, no. Um, so Liz asks, um, could you speak on the voice actor casting choices of the studio's films? I've picked up on character accents that readers such 
depth and respect to the character history, thinking of Wolf Walkers and My Father's Dragon specifically, where you can hear the main characters' voices contrast with other characters of their respective new locations. Hmm. I, I won't speak too much about My Father's Dragon. I wasn't terribly involved in that project. Like early on, I did concept art and stuff, but at a certain point, you know, Nora just ran with it with her team. And I think a lot of the casting in My Father's Dragon was done in conjunction with Netflix. And, you know, there was, it was a whole other, that was a whole other type of a project. It was more, a Netflix, it was a, equally a Netflix film as a cartoon film film. Whereas for our films, yeah, we always have the character actors in mind. And for the adult parts, I've been so lucky. I've had my first choice for nearly every, I did, I did consider briefly some other people to play Oliver Cromwell, but Simon McBurney, made the most sense in the end and he was definitely even in mind when we were designing the character even if it's only subtly and Sean Bean was absolutely who we had in mind we were, I remember we were watching Game of Thrones while we were working on the, the development of Wolf Walkers and so we'd often do bad Sean Bean impersonations as we wrote the lines and stuff <laughs> and then and then I've been really lucky with the young actors like there's a young girl Eva Whitaker who we discovered she was eight and she'd never done any acting before and she got the part of Maeve from an open casting. You know, we worked with a casting agent and uh, she was so talented. She ended up being like, we have a new movie coming out of Puff and Rock this summer. She's the main character in that. She's the voice of Dal, the main character in Star Wars Visions. So she's just been amazing. And she was just a total find by just putting out a call to find the voice of Maeve. So sometimes when we find a good actor like that, we kind of work with them again and again, you know. Do you, um, you just mentioned, Tom, that you sort of, um, you know, uh, with Oliver Cromwell, do you find that you, do you sketch the actors while they're recording their, their voices or do you film their performance a bit like, you know, other studios do and, and put that in there? Or is it you kind of, you know who the voice actor is going to be and then that's obviously going to inform some of the shape language choices of the character design. And do you ever try and sort of not get a likeness, but sort of imbue the characters with that sort of intangible part of that actor? Is that what you guys try and do? For sure. And like even before we cast Sean Bean, we were thinking of him for the part of the dad in Wolf Walkers and Simon as well. Um, once we hit on him as our first choice, we started, you know, looking at photos and performances and everything. And then when we record the actors, we always video them. And I will be sketching during the recording sessions because I'm a compulsive doodler. But um, we show those like the animators have access to those recordings but I think Nora does that a little bit more than me Nora's more of an actor type herself and she will act out stuff whereas I will tend to lean a little bit more on cartooning and drawing so I don't like to get too close to something that you might consider some kind of motion capture type approach but I definitely encourage the animators to look at the actor and also the actors are performing in uh we don't have them in a booth. We like to record them on a sound stage so they can see each other, but they're not moving around or anything. So there's a limit to how much you can use. Besides maybe some small facial expressions, there's a limit to how much you can use it as reference for the animation. But um, to some extent, all the all the voice actors um, have influenced the characters and even changed the design slightly. Like I feel like Robin's design evolved a bit when we cast underneath the. Um, if you look at the designs before and after we cast her, she looked a little bit different. She just had an effect on bigger eyes and different things, yeah. Mm. Cool. So, um, George asked, do you have a favourite character design and voice? Maybe, maybe you will answer the question, do you, have a, do you have a character whose voice ultimately suits the most? The yeah, I, I, I mean, I can't really pick one. Um, because I think they all like I, I mean Brendan Gleeson for example was just fantastic as the dad in Song of the Sea and in um, Secret of Kells and, and he was someone that was a great supporter of the studio early on and Fanula Flanagan as Maka was amazing too but uh, Mick Lally's dead now and he did the voice of Brother Aiden and when I was a kid in Ireland he was really famous because he was on this like very long running soap opera in Ireland and so even though he was pretty famous and, and accomplished theatre actor, you know, he was more known for playing Miley and Glen Rowe, you know. And so it was a real kick to hire him and to work with him. And I love Brother Aiden. I always loved the character. So I'm just drawing him now as I talk about. And um, 
and it's nice when I and Mick recorded the the Panger Bond poem, and for the end credits, and that poem was a, a poem I'd learned in school, um, and so that was always I always like hearing that come up in the credits, and you know, I suppose the fact that he passed away makes it all the more poignant that it was one of his last roles, you know. Even at emphysema recording it, um, and uh, we had to incorporate his sniffles and coughs and stuff into the animation, <laughs> but it made mm -hmm. sense because he was playing this old monk who'd been, you know, living in the woods for so long, and everything. So it was part of his character. So yeah, I suppose, mm. I mean, it's hard to pick. Like Lisa Hannigan was amazing as Brona yeah. in Song of the Sea, and and we picked her more because she was a singer. And then she ended up doing more voice acting and she popped up on Steven Universe and different things afterwards. So I'm very proud to have been the, the first person to give Lisa Hannigan the voice acting role. Wonderful. Uh, jo Joyce says Mick Lally had an absolutely wonderful voice in Kells. Uh, may you rest in peace. Um, yeah. We're going to start to wrap up, everyone. So any, any last questions? We'll get through as many as we can if you have any other thoughts. Um, but I don't know if you're able to share your, I don't know if it's Google Chrome you have, Tom, at some point, just to wonder if we could pull up everyone's work and just have a little scroll okay, through. Okay, um, okay, okay. Uh, let me see. Sorry to um, no, no, direct you. Stop sharing and then share we'll screen throw some other and... questions your way as well. But I'll go to yours. So we've got six minutes left with Tom. Um, Morgan asks, I'd love to know what your thoughts are on adult animation. Have you ever watched, what, sorry, have you ever wanted to create a project aimed specifically more at mature audiences? That's an interesting question because just today at lunchtime, um, I uh, I just drew this. That's great. And you even got the thing in the front. Um, Nora is really interesting. Now. She's the one who developed like a live action horror film a few years ago. And uh, I think Nora is definitely, and, and also Paul, um, after Screechers Reach, I think he was interested in exploring, so great, um, exploring more like an older audience, not just for kids. These are great. Some of these are really caricature they're fantastic. Yeah, they're amazing. So quick. I love how people go straight to caricature. Now, I'll always draw a relatively something between life, life drawing and caricature first, and then I'll do another pass and another pass to get the caricature, you know, but some of these are fantastic. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, question. Uh, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Did somebody uh, did somebody just go on mic? Well, maybe it was an accident. Maybe it was just. Uh, okay. This is fun. I like this. It's great stuff, um, yeah, in terms of um, <laughs> the studio term, obviously you have, you have internships from time to time. Are there kind of golden nuggets of advice you have for people uh, applying to animation studios? Um, kind of do's and don'ts or, or mm. maybe, you know, stand up from the crowd, do something special. Is there or, or is there a best internship application you've ever seen that's wowed you? Not to say that would necessarily why you a second time, but what's the secret, do you think? Oh, uh, we, we, we have a lovely, some of these are fantastic. We have a lovely um, tradition, as it happens, of people who are interns in the studio, like Federico, Adrian Merjo, who was art director on Song of the Sea, started as an intern. A lot of people in the studio started as interns, and often just being in the studio and working with us, we get to know the artists and get to know what they're good at. Like Sandra Anderson, who's in charge of our character posing department and all the model sheets and everything. She, I remember I was just walking past her desk one day and I saw her drawing the characters while she was on her internship. And I just really liked how she drew the characters. And so it's worth coming, if you can get an internship, it's worth getting into the studio just to meet the people. And you never know what way it will go. I personally, now I don't always pick the interns myself. Maybe if I'm in production and we're looking for somebody for a department that I'm really involved in, like storyboard or design, I might, otherwise it's usually the supervisor, so they might say something different. But for me, I like a kind of a wild card. Like I'm always, 
Of course, we'll always take the intern who looks like they're plug and play, they're ready to go. If they have good animation or good storyboards or good character design or whatever, and we think, oh, well, we'll definitely put them to work and maybe they'll end up being somebody that we keep on afterwards. But then again, on the other side, I have a soft spot for people like Federico who just draw a bit different than I do. And then I'm like, I want to add them into the mix. <laughs> I think someone drew me in the middle of this. Um, I want to add that person into the mix. So it's, it's, it's no harm if you have an, a style that's very divergent from the studio you're applying to, to still give it a go because it might be what they're looking for. But by and large, I'd say the good advice is to, if you're applying for an animation internship, make sure your reel is good and apply to the animation supervisor. If you're applying to storyboards, make sure you've got good examples of your storyboards. And it's just like applying for a job, you know. Oh, wow. So and then beyond that, I mean, getting that first thing in the door will be obviously a lot of um, a lot of thoughts of uh, our audience today, you know, getting that in, in the industry. But what, what, what's the it's secret excellent. to longevity in the industry, do you think? Um, I think the people who... You might have answered that earlier. Yeah, I think people who are like willing to change it up and try different things and think like a filmmaker rather than a specialist, you know, like it doesn't really matter what department you're in. If you're thinking like a filmmaker, you'll find a role as the as the roles evolve and change. So I think staying interested in the overall storytelling, feeling like you're part of a filmmaking team rather than the best ever X, you know, special effects artist or whatever. I think specialization can help. And if it's really what you love, of course, do that. But I think longevity usually comes from being open to moving departments, moving roles, moving whatever it takes to be part of the filmmaking process. You know? Yeah, um, actually. Yeah. Great. Uh, we've got lots of love in the, the chat um for the session, Tom. Um I'm just enjoying, time. I'm I'm enjoying to... seeing the some people threw in character designs and everything. Oh wow, look at that. Yeah, wow. Well, Thanks a lot for inviting me. I really enjoyed us. this. <laughs> yeah, I think that's been fabulous. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, and sorry, uh, as Harrow's put in the chat, it's been such an honour to be in Tom Moore's digital presence. You're one of the artists <laughs> I look up to. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Been absolutely uh, fantastic hearing you. Need to see Wolf Walkers and finish watching the trilogy. That's from George. Um, very, it's been really wonderful. Thank you. Very inspired. That's from Linda. I think, you know, I mean, everyone's, I still think I speak for everybody when I say it's been amazing and the time has gone too quickly. Yeah. Well, I really, I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, really nice way to hang out with you all. I think if the pandemic showed us nothing else, it's lovely to hang out over Zoom sometimes. So, thanks so much. Yeah. All right, I'm sure I'll see you guys. Soon. Thanks a lot, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank thanks you, everyone. Thank you. All the thanks organizing. everyone in the chat. Great questions. Really appreciate it. Have a great Good evening, night. everyone. Good night. Good Good night. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye.